Amen. Stand to your feet as we go to the word of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17, 17 through 20. You may have to turn my lights up just a little bit in the room so they can see their scriptures and be able to take their notes. Whoever's controlling those lights so that parishioners can make sure they can see. I see people doing like this, trying to see their Bibles because it's too dark. Give them a little bit of light. <laughs> Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 through 20. It reads this way. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, I'm reading out a New King James translation. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has, here it is, reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. My God. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. So we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. <laughs> Listen, I'm going to be continuing. This is our third, our third installment in the series that we've begun called Judged. Judged. And, and the reason I'm speaking on this subject is because the world is hungry for people whose goals are to build people up. You watched the video. You heard the story, the testimonies of those individuals who had encountered some church, some ministry, some organization somewhere. And though they may not have spoken it publicly in a private setting, in a private situation, this is how they felt. Like sitting in the judgment seat and experiencing the pain of rejection from people who do not understand their purpose in the church. So they're hungry. They're hungry for people to nurture and not exploit them, to build them up and not tear them down, to undergird, to enhance them, rather than try to control and manipulate people. The world is hungry for people who operate in the spirit of our master and be, here's the word I want you to get today, bridge Builder. Look at somebody and say, I'm a bridge builder. Yeah, yeah, I'm a bridge builder. Because we are not in the business of building walls. We're in the business of building bridges, not building walls. We're in the business of connecting people to God and to each other. That's, that's what we're in the business of. That's what we do. We're connectors. And so it's hard for you to be a connector if you're judgmental. So we're going to talk about that today, okay? Look at somebody and say, I'm a bridge builder. Yeah. Father, over the next few moments, I ask that you would anoint me to preach your word. Be glorified in this place, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, I'm a builder. Jesus said this in one place. He said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. That's what we need in our churches more peacemakers, less hell raisers. Yeah, I thought I'd just shock you with that first thing, just right off the dome. More people are concerned about pulling people together rather than tearing people apart. You know, connecting itself, connecting, connecting people in and of itself is a ministry. Did you know that? That most people, when they think of ministry, they think of like uh, credentials and ordination, platforms. They think of stages. They think of specially set aside people who have trained themselves or gone to seminary and they have earned the opportunity to stand in front of a congregation and have oil poured on their head and hands laid upon them and say, now you are released to serve in ministry. That's what we think when we think ministry, Changela. Somebody who walks in who is specially designed and prepared and they walk in in that air of, I have been called to ministry. But 
I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that without any of that, without any of that ornate things that we do that set aside people to so-called ministry, that we have all received a ministry. Did you know that? That if you are a believer, if nobody lays hands on you, gives you a license, gives you credentials, that according to Paul, each one of us have been given what he calls the ministry of reconciliation. Yeah, don't let that word scare you, reconciliation. It simply means connectors. That God has given you a ministry designed to connect people, to bring people together, to connect them to God and also to each other. Some of you that work in accounting may be familiar with reconcile in this way. In the accounting, from, a, from the accounting standpoint, it means to compare two sets of documents and make sure that they are, here it is, in agreement. That one account has to be consistent with the other account. That if I spend money over here, I should be able to track it over there. And whenever there's something happens and I'm spending money over here, but I can't account for it over there, I got to reconcile to make sure they balance out. And if I look up and I see that there's something that's been paid for here, and we can't account for it over there, if money comes out from this account and doesn't show up in, say, for example, your bank account or your credit card, then we've got a problem. And we have to fix that situation, make sure it reconciles, make sure it balances out. Right? We have to make sure there are no conflicts, no inconsistencies, no, no discrepancies. It has to balance out. We have to make sure that this matches with that. We understand that from the accounting standpoint. Here, want you, we want you to understand today that without God in your life, your life is out of balance. Your life is deeply out of balance. Here's what Jesus said. He said, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What am I saying? It is possible to be winning and losing at the same time. That many people, when it comes to their spirituality, they say, I must be winning because, look, I got a new house. I got a new car. I got a new boo. I've got plenty of money in the bank. I'm winning. But it is possible for you to be winning on this side and losing on this side. And if you gain everything in the world and you don't have God, you are still deeply out of balance. Your life is still deeply out of balance. And God's desire is to bring your life, here it is, into harmony. Just because you got a new car don't mean you got peace with God. I think one of the dangerous things we've done, Michael, with church people is we made them assume that the more things you have, the more God you have. And so we equate our spirituality and our walk with God by the number of zeros that are behind our check. Or the, number, or the size of the house that we have, or the size of the car that we drive. And so we say, I must be okay spiritually because look, I just got a new car. Isn't it pretty? I just bought a grand new house, so I must be all right with God. But it is possible, beloved of God, to have all these material things going for you and still be losing. And so from our standpoint, you're winning. But from God's standpoint, he stands as the great accountant and said, there's a discrepancy here. Yeah, your life is out of balance. Yeah, this is not showing up on this ledger. I'm looking at your general ledger and the things in your life, and it's not showing up here. And so God's desire is to help us to get our lives in a place of balance and harmony. Reconciliation from a Bible standpoint simply means this. It means to restore, to get this friendly relations to compatibility, to bring back into agreement or to a former state of harmony. Right? It involves a change in the relationship between God and man or between man and man, and it assumes that there's been a breakdown in the relationship. Right? We need to be reconciled. We need to be back into harmony. We need to be back into fellowship because the assumption is that something has happened that has occurred that has broken that fellowship. And so when we reconcile something, I'm changing from a state of enmity, of fragmentation, to one of harmony and fellowship. Are you with me? So this is where we come in. Because when people come into our doors, they have been broken by life. They have been broken by circumstances. They have been broken by every imaginable ill that the world has to offer. And when they come into our midst, they don't come in expecting people to fragment them worse to make them feel worse, to fragment them more, they're hoping to find somebody who can help them get their life together. First with God, with God and then with each other. Because I find that many people who have a good relationship with God 
sometimes don't have a good relationship with other people. And the fact of the matter is God wants you to get along with God and with other people. And some people put so much emphasis on their relationship with God, but even, so what I'm saying is that even church people, though they lift their hands in his presence, though they dance around the church, though they can quote scriptures, they don't have good relationships, they don't get along with people, and God's desire is that he help your life be reconciled, connected both with him and with other people. See, here's the thing. Here's where we come in. So what we have to do as believers is we help people. Our ministry assignment is to help people reconnect to God. Our job is not to go find out why. And sometimes we're so distracted we're trying to figure out why. Well, what happened? That doesn't matter. What matters is that my life is broken and I need somebody to help me get my life together. Our job is to invite people in. Hear me, rather than drive people out. The reason I'm talking about being about judge is because when people judge, they operate in the spirit of the enemy. And his job is to kill, steal, and destroy. His job is to take broken people and break them further. He is an accuser of the brethren. His job is to always point out what's wrong with you, what happened to you, and why you don't fit and why you don't belong. And many people would be afraid to walk into our doors and even be in the midst of us because they're afraid that somebody is going to break me further. I've already been broken. I've already been fragmented. My life is already torn in pieces. The last thing I need is for some judgmental person to point out further what's wrong with me. Yeah, that's the spirit of the enemy. His job is to separate people, to alienate people, to divide people. So that when they come into our church as a visitor or even as a member, that they already feel alienated and I feel more alienated. Because he wants to leave them, listen at this, fragmented. He likes it. He loves seeing broken people feel more fragmented than they already do. So, so here's what the enemy uses. He uses everything to keep us fragmented from our God and from people. He uses everything. Everything, any, any reason to divide, it could be about your race, it could be about your skin color, your education, your gender, your background, what part of the country you were brought up in, your dialect, how you pronounce your words. Anything that he can use, he will use it to keep us further divided. Anything, even in a church like this, he likes to put us into camps into groups. And so all the people who are light-skinned, we don't get together. And all the people who have this proclivity, we're going to all get together. And all the people who like football, we're going to all get together. Because he loves to keep us separated, even in the midst of a unified church. Because his tactic has always been to divide and conquer. He knows if I can get you over by yourself, Get you away from the people, get you away from the church, get you away from the fellowship. You know, the greatest struggle that people are having right now with going back to church is not Corona. It's that we've gotten used to not being together. Yeah. Yeah, I've gotten used to not having to connect with you on that level. And so when I get ready to come and reconnect with you, even online or in person, it's easier for me to be isolated. And I want to just warn you, even during this crisis that we have learned to endure, that you do not lose your desire nor intent to get together because the devil loves to isolate you, separate you, keep you away from the fellowship keep you away from the saints because if I can get you over by yourself yeah I divide you from the people we get strength from each other we get encouragement from each other so my tactic is to get you away from the people you would normally get strength from because there I can begin to wear you out there I can begin to play tricks with your mind there I can begin to make you doubt your existence I can doubt make you doubt your worth Make you doubt your value because you don't have anybody there to encourage you and say, hang on in there. And so the enemy loves to make me fall out with you because as long as we're not touching and agreeing, we can't get things done. Jesus told us if we touch and agree on anything in earth, we shall have it. But how can we have it if we can't touch and agree so the enemy works to keep us divided? 
And so when people come in with their issues and their problems, the enemy has a way of making them think that their issues and problems are so much greater than the people around them. Oh, if I was just as holy as he was. If I had my life together like she does. If I had my, my money together or my marriage together like they do, I would be accepted. And so because I'm deeply aware of how broken and fragmented my life is, I stay away. In every human being, there's, there's a hole in your soul in the shape of God. In every human being, there's a hole in your soul in the shape of God, and only he can fill that void. We try to fill it with things, and we try to fill it with people, and we always come up disappointed. Because no matter how many things you get, no matter how many toys you have, no matter how many relationships you have, there is still a longing in each of us to be reconnected with our God. Some people, I hate to say this because, you know, I, I only misunderstood, but some people believe that marriage is the end all and the be all. So the desire sometimes is to get married. If I get married, then I'll be happy. But the truth is, marriage is a ministry too. Because all it is, all marriage is, Mark, is God loving somebody through you. That's all it is. It's God loving somebody else through you. That's, that's, that's all marriage is. You, you find somebody who knows your flaws, knows your faults, knows your problems, your brokenness, and your pain. And they love you anyway. If you find somebody that can look past all your issues and still love you, that's somebody you don't want to let get away. I mean, with all your faults, I mean, I know, you, I know you think you're perfect. Let me talk about me. With all my faults and all my issues and all my problems and all my brokenness and all my pain, for somebody to be in a covenant relationship with you and say, with all that I see, I'm going to stay, that's what marriage is. Marriage is God showing forgiveness through your spouse. I'm going to show you what grace looks like. I'm going to show you what love looks like. It's me loving you through them. So you can't get in a position where you worship the person because it's really God loving you through the person. I can't get no amens. I'll give you a spouse, but you can't worship the spouse because it's really me loving you through the spouse. I just put somebody with a covenant relationship with you who has vowed to love you, love me through that person. So, so, I, so I appreciate deep relationship because it doesn't have to be just marriage. It could be friendships. To have the kind of friends who can stand by you, stand with you, support you, cover you, even with all your craziness, that person is valuable. Who will be there with you even though you've got your issues, you've got your challenges, and I still be your friend. And I don't get turned off by the fact that you're broken because I'm just as broken as you are. Those people are valuable. So it doesn't have to be marriage. It can be friendship. But the point is that we are connectors. The point is that God wants us to be connected. But listen, even with those deep relationships, and I appreciate all of them, friendship and marriage, the deepest longing of my soul is to be connected with my God. The deepest, I appreciate marriage, I appreciate friendship, I appreciate your camaraderie, but the deepest longing of my soul is to be connected with my God. David said this, he said, as a deer pants after water, my soul longs for you. That's where my real soul is. I appreciate my friends. I appreciate what they give me and what they bring me. But past that, there's something bigger that only God can give me. And my soul is thirsty for a connection with my creator. And that's true about everybody who walks into our midst. When they walk in, they come in longing for and panting for water from the presence of God. That's why we can't be in the way and we can't be judgmental and we can't separate people and we can't kick them out and we can't dismiss them because somebody came in here today longing to get a touch from the creator. My soul's greatest desire is to be reconnected with my God. And anything that prevents that has to be rejected. 
Anything that prevents me from getting to my altar, from getting into God's presence, I have to eliminate. Because at the end of the day, Daphne, we can have good singing, we can have good preaching, we can have good dancing. But if I walk away and my soul is still parched, it was a waste of time. I appreciate seeing you, and I'm glad that you're here, but I came to see Jesus. If I don't get nothing else today, I want to make sure that my soul has spent time in the presence of God, and it is saturated. I have things, I have friends, I have stuff, but what I need is God. Somebody shout amen. So when you and I, and even other people, Come into the church. And I'm going to mess with you about it. I'm going to keep on messing with you until it gets in your spirit. I'm going to keep on talking to you about this until God convinces you. I'm going to keep on putting this in your spirit until you understand that God wants to use you to bridge people's needs to the source of their need. That's your ministry. Look at somebody and say, I'm in the ministry. That's your ministry. Look at him again. That's your ministry. If, look at him again. Yeah, that's your ministry. If you're wondering what your ministry is, we were talking about this with the men a few weeks ago, and we were talking about how to find your ministry, how to identify your ministry, because we always think about something that requires some special training. But in reality, God has already put that ministry down in you that you should be operating in. So I'm going to about three things going to help you and help this church to be a bridge builder, okay? Write this down. I want to talk to you about the method of the bridge. The method of the bridge. The scripture says this, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, connecting the world to himself through Christ. That Christ was the vehicle that God used to bridge the gap between God and man. That sin ensued in the garden. That man broke the covenant with God, that God, that man broke the commandment, and it disrupted their fellowship. One man, through disobedience, disrupted the fellowship, disrupted it, and made cause chaos, confusion, and conflict between God and man for thousands of years. One man. But also through one man, thousands of years later, that relationship was restored through his obedience. One man, Jesus Christ, that through his obedience, that man now has the opportunity to have that reconnection with his God. That unity was restored. The conflict was ended. Justice was satisfied. The discrepancy has been resolved. The enmity, the enmity, the wall of separation between God and man has been torn down through the method, through the person of Jesus Christ. The greatest thing that Jesus gave to any of us was our fellowship with God again. Nobody get excited about that. The greatest thing that God gave you was not a new car. <laughs> the greatest thing that God gave you was not a new house. The greatest thing that God gave you was not a new pair of shoes. The greatest thing that Jesus Christ gave to us was a bridge that made it possible for man to cross over from sin, from, holiness, from sin into holiness. Now, we don't get excited about that. If I said that the Lord was going to drop a million on you, we'd have to hit the organ, hit the band, we'd have to run all around the church. But if I just told you that the greatest thing that Jesus gave to you was the opportunity after thousands and thousands of years of not even being able to come into the presence of God and experience his holiness and experience his peace, and now I can come in and have peace with God, that's worth praising God for. Yeah, he made it possible for me. He was my bridge. He made it possible to cross over from death to life, from sickness to health, from debt into wealth, from hatred into love, from penalty into forgiveness, from alienation to acceptance. That's what my Jesus gave me. Somebody give God praise for being my bridge. Oh, I said give God praise for being your bridge. When you were left outside in the yard and you couldn't get in, you couldn't be accepted, Jesus Christ became the bridge that made it possible for you to come into God's presence and to ask for whatever you need. If anybody ought to be excited about Jesus, it ought to be the same. Somebody take 30 seconds and give God praise for Jesus. 
Somebody give God, I mean, I didn't have a door, I didn't have a way in, I couldn't be accepted, I couldn't live long enough, I couldn't live high enough, I couldn't jump high enough to accept, be accepted by God, but Jesus. Give God 30 seconds of praise for Jesus being your... Because of my sin, I couldn't get up to him. The gulf between man and God was so wide. That no matter how far I jumped, I couldn't cross it. But Jesus came. Jesus was God's hand reaching down to you. Where you couldn't come up, he reached down to you. Where you couldn't get your life together, he didn't wait for you to get your life together and, and start become, become a church mother and become a deacon. I mean, while you were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet at enmity, you know enmity means to be an enemy? Me and God are at odds. And God stepped over all of your angry attitude and reached to you anyway. That's why I love God more than anybody in this world. Because most people will love you if you act right, do right, be right. But God said, even with you being hateful and mean, even with you talking about I'm not real and saying I don't matter, I still reach past your issues. I reach past all of your objections. I reach past all of your excuses. I reach past the fact that you chased after false gods. I reach past the fact that you were out here worshiping devils, and I reached in and I grabbed you anyway to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. God was in Christ making a connection. God, Jesus was God reaching out to you. Reaching past your faults and seeing your needs. And he didn't wait for you to get your life together that while you were left sinners, he died for you. I lay down my life for somebody that ain't even thinking about me, don't even like me, won't even support me, don't respect me, but I lay down my life for you. That's love. That's the method God used. God stepped over stuff that was smelly and dirty and nasty and reached for you anyway. So if we're going to do it like God do it, we got to step over our prejudices, our issues, our preferences, and reach the people that don't look like us. We, we like people to be able to deserve our love. You deserve my attention. Yeah, I like the way you dress. You deserve my attention. But God said, if you're going to be like me, you got to reach for people that don't even seem to deserve your attention. The worst. The wretched. In fact, here's how God is. The worse you are, the more he like it. Yeah. Yeah. The more fragmented you are, the more God likes you. The more problems you got, the more God wants to get in. Not like us. We want easy problems. I want people that don't have many issues. I don't want to work through trouble and stress and, and problems. I, I want somebody that look like they're going to might be something. You look like you might be a preacher one day. I'm going to work with you. Yeah. You look like you might be a good wife one day. I'm going to work with you. But God said, I'm going to take the worst. If you're looking for the glory, show me the most broken. If you're looking... For where God's glory is going to fall the greatest, show me the person with the worst problems. Y'all don't want to hear that today. He's not looking for the, the folk that got it together, fixed up. The ones that God is looking for are the ones who have the worst problems. That's who God is reaching for. God will reach past all the people who think they deserve to be blessed. And find somebody sitting in the back in the corner thinking, Lord, if you just bless me, I'm a dog. I don't even deserve to be here. I shouldn't even be in the house. But if you bless me, because those people, those people who have been forgiven much will appreciate him much. And the reason it's hard to get a praise out of the saints is because you've forgotten. You got amnesia. You done got all such a much. You done got all cleaned up now. You forgot that five years ago you were looking just like them. And I try to find the people who got the worst problems and work with them because when they give God a praise, their praise is for real. My praise ain't for play play. 
You can play if you want to. But if God hadn't got me out of the mess I was in, I wouldn't even be here. I want somebody that really appreciates God to open your mouth and give God a praise for yourself. Where the thankful people at? We're the people that know you ain't nothing. You've been brought out of some mess that you wouldn't even be. Oh, I know. I know you got your degrees now. You got your incline suits on. You got your fancy Mercedes out front. You got your fancy car. You got all this stuff. But I want to find some real people in here that know that all this fancy stuff is nothing but God. Come on, somebody. Where the real praisers at? We're the people that's been sitting up in a hospital bed and God had to touch you. We're the folk that was praying God saved my child and God had to get him out of trouble. We're somebody who had a bad doctor's report. It was cancer and you shouldn't even be here at all. Oh, wait a minute. This is a good place for a praise break right here. I, I, I'm not talking about what you're going to get later. I'm talking about for the things he's already done. Somebody owes God a praise for what he's already done. Is there anybody in here? If he don't do nothing else, he's already blessed me. And I'm going to take about 30 seconds right here and give him my best praise. Come on and take it and give it to him right here. Oh, you ain't going to thank him. You ain't going to thank him. You ain't going to thank him. I said, look at somebody. I said, I'm going to praise him right here. Oh, hallelujah. I'm to get happy all by myself in a minute. I'm trying to wait on y'all before I go running down the road. But when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. I know we're social distancing, but for those who came with somebody, would you just touch them real quick and say, neighbor, I don't mean to get on your nerves, but God's been too good for me, for me to be quiet about it. You have to give me about 30 seconds right here while I give God my best praise. Now go ahead and praise him like you want to. I said, go ahead and praise him like you want to. If he don't do nothing else, he's already done enough. Just like that, brother. That's what I'm talking about. Just like that. If you want to understand my praise, you got to understand my pain. So don't look at me funny when you see me praising God. Just know there's a story behind this glory. There's a testimony behind this test. When you see me lifting my hands, you talk about it don't take all that. Why you got to jump around? Why you got to run around? Why you got to sweat? If you knew my story. Look at somebody saying, you don't know my story. You don't know my story. How dare you hate on my praise when you don't know my story. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I had to put up with. You don't know what I had to drag myself out of. I wish you would sit there. I... See, when you really come through something, you ain't got to drag nobody into a praise, Sharita. When you really come through something, you ain't got to drag nobody and say, come on, come on, come on. All you got to do is think about where you were last year and two years ago and five years ago. All you got to do is think about the time you had no food in your refrigerator and God touched somebody's heart to come by your house. You didn't even know they were coming. to you why would you try to be a wall to impede people from experiencing the same God who has blessed you why would you try to judge them and keep them from accessing the same thing that changed your life has he changed anybody life in here is there anybody in here that Jesus has changed your life give God 30 seconds of praise right here So look, let's talk about the mission of the bridge because here, maybe here's the problem. God has given unto us the ministry. He's given unto us, given uh, the same thing that he gave me. I now have to give to somebody else. That's the mission. You can't give away anything that you have not first received. The reason many people can't give love is because you haven't received love. You can't give mercy because you really haven't received mercy. So you tend to be judgmental because you haven't received the fact that God loves you too. I'm hard on you 
because I haven't received it for myself. My prayer for you is that you would be convinced, overwhelmed, and overtaken with God's love for you. And that you then operate out of what you receive. If you receive forgiveness, then you give forgiveness. If you receive mercy, then you can give mercy. If you receive love, then you can give love. You got to operate in it. And many people can't operate in mercy because you have not really received mercy. See, when, look, look at this. When it comes to soul winning, it, it's really not that hard. It's really not. Because all you're really doing is giving people what you've already received. You don't need a degree in theology to be a soul winner. The greatest thing that you have is your own testimony. That without a degree, a license, a credential, anything, without fancy words, without practicing your fancy 30-second elevator speech, you can be effective in God's hand to win a soul for Christ, to win a soul in the church, simply by giving them your testimony. The Bible says this, that they overcame the wicked one by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Don't let the devil intimidate you about what you've been through. Because the most powerful part of your life is your testimony. And we spend so much time trying to hide our testimony. I got to pretend I was always together. I got to pretend I was always smart. I got to pretend I always knew the right thing to do. I got to pretend I always made good decisions. And so we're so busy trying to whitewash our story that you washed out the most powerful part of your testimony. They need to hear that you were me. I was you. What qualifies me to speak to you is because I've been where you've been. I've lived where you lived. I've struggled with the same addiction that you struggle with. I've made the same mistakes that you had. I had kids out of wedlock. I spent time in jail. I had to go to rehab. I was selling my body for a quarter. See, y'all don't want to get there. I know. These are the church folks in here, Charita. They don't want to get out and get, get dirty to the real testimony. See, people are not getting delivered because you're not telling them your real testimony. You're giving them the edited version. Yeah, yeah. I want the edited version. You know, it's whitewashed, it's really nice, but it's not powerful because it's not true. When you're standing in front of somebody whose eyes are red from smoking all night long and they, you know what that looks like, you can tell them, you can minister to them because you know what that's like. That's why we're not effective with our own kids. We don't tell the truth. We try to pretend like we would never do that and we've never been there and your testimony, your speech is un un unauthentic because you're not telling the truth. And they know you're not telling the truth. And there you are trying to give people a whitewashed version. If people knew that people in this church were just as broken as they were, they wouldn't be afraid to come in the door. They wouldn't be afraid to show their scars. They wouldn't be so afraid to come in and be among us and be comfortable because somewhere in this room, there's somebody just like me. And if God did it for you, maybe he can do it for me. Good God Almighty. If God blessed you to come out of a bad situation, he can bless me. But what we do, the enemy likes to intimidate you. And say, don't tell your testimony. Don't, don't really tell them that. They ain't going to be able to handle it. And by doing so, it robs us of the greatest part of our testimony. I guarantee you, if I bring up anything, any wicked, any nasty thing in this room, there's somebody that's been there and done that in this room. I guarantee you. I guarantee you. If I bring up anything, you don't need, listen, hear me, you don't need a degree in theology. You ain't got to go to seminary. You don't have to go through ministerial training. All you really need is a genuine experience with God to be powerful. That's all you need. 
just, just have a real, I mean, a real encounter with God, and that's what's going to make you effective. <laughs> my, I'm, let me prove to you. My Bible tells me that there was one man who was blind from birth, and Jesus healed him. And when the people came around him, they wanted to discredit Jesus by saying, do you not know that that man is a sinner? <laughs> He's a devil. He's a false prophet. You run around talking about I'm healed, I'm delivered. The man that did that, he's a devil. And here's what the man said, Connie. He said, look, I don't know if he's a devil or not. I don't know if he's a sinner or not. I don't know what he is. I don't know if he's a false prophet, a devil, a demon, whatever. But what I do know is where I once was blind. You going to that church over there? Do you know who that is? Do you know where they come from? I don't know. I don't know the background. I don't know the history. I don't know who their mama is. But what I do know is that they spoke a word. Oh, never mind. I don't know theology. I don't know eschatology. I don't know all the books of the Bible. I don't know all the bowls in the Old Testament. But what I do know is where I was blind. Look at somebody say, I got a testimony. Yeah, I ain't been to ministerial school, but I got a testimony. Ain't nobody laid hands and poured no oil on my head, but I got a testimony. And my testimony is what makes me powerful. Good God Almighty. It's not my credentials that make me effective. It's my testimony. Look at somebody say, I wish we had testimony service. I wish we had testimony. That's what we need, people who will tell the truth. the enemy wants to do is intimidate you and say you ain't got no credentials you ain't got no qualifications my testimony has qualified me to speak to you my testimony has qualified me to stand up in the middle of your situation and tell you that God will bring you out of it how do you know because he brought me Put down your, humble yourself. Put down your credentials. Put down your robes. Put down your titles. Put down your positions and pull out your testimony because nobody cares about your title. Can I say that, Mark? Who cares about your title if it don't touch me? I don't care what you drive. I don't care what kind of robes you have. I don't care who your pastor was and who laid hands on you. I want to know that God do something in your life. Talk to me, somebody. That's our mission. Our mission is to make people who are broken realize I'm just as broken as you, and you're welcome here. I'm going to show you how to get what I got. I'm a, I was you. I used to do that. I was tied up. I was bound up. But I'm going to show you how I got free. My mission is to show you where to get the freedom. Look at somebody and say, we're connectors. Last thing, and I'm done. Are you getting something out of this? I'm going to talk about the message of the bridge. Here's what Paul's simple message. He says, as ambassadors for God, as representatives of God, here's what he says. Be ye reconciled to God. Come back to God. That when I look at you, you wonder why I'm passionate about what I do, why I'm passionate about preaching, you know why we're passionate about helping you? Like, for example, in the worship service, we will be passionate about getting you into the worship. And when I'm preaching, I'm passionate about what I'm trying to say to you. Because my job, when I look at you, is to connect you to the power. I'm pleading with you as an ambassador, be connected. I see you're disconnected. I see you're disinterested. I see you're out of sorts. And my job is to connect you to the source. Once I connect you to the source, I can step out of the movie. My job is not to connect you to me. My job is to connect you to him. That something we say or something we sing or something we play compels you to come out of whatever you're into and get connected to the source. I, my grandmother used to have one of them old TVs. I'm, I'm aging. I'm telling my age now. She used to have one of them old TVs in the house, great big piece of furniture, Anybody remember them great big TVs? I mean, yeah, it had the great big screen. We got flat screens now. You hang it right up on the wall. But I'm saying we used to have them great big boxes with the TV in it. 
Yeah, some of y'all remember that. Young people were like, what? Yeah. Great big box with the TV in it. And I swear, Carmen, that TV, I was a kid, I have never seen that TV on. We used it for everything. She put plants on top of it. She did. She put decorations on top of it. One year we put a Christmas tree on top of it. <laughs> we never used the TV for what it was designed for, which is to show pictures. So one day my curious tail wanted to know why. I got behind the TV box, pulled out the plug, and plugged it in. And a picture came on. And I started asking my grandmother, how come we never used the TV for what it's supposed to be used for? My suspicion is some of you are being used for everything except for what God has used you for. You're decorated. You're pretty. You're sitting in the corner all cute. But you're not being used for what God wants to use you for. In fact, you're letting the devil use you for everything except for what God created you for. You were created to praise him. You were created to worship him. You were created to serve him. And what people do when they're disconnected from God, they're susceptible to be used by the devil for everything and anything. But I come to plug you into the power. Once I plug you into the power, I ain't got to tell you to break up with your boyfriend. Once I plug you into the power, I ain't got to tell you to put down them drugs. Once I plug you into the power, I ain't got to tell you to leave the alcohol alone. Once I plug you into the power, look at somebody and say, get plugged in. That spirit that divides and pushes people away is not of God. That spirit that makes people feel funny when they come in our service and we make them feel like they're not welcome, it is not of God. Here's what Jesus told them in one parable of the Great Supper. He said, go into the highways and into the hedges, and here's the word, compel them to come. There's a spirit in our churches where we sit around and we want people to come to us. We're going to open the doors and we want people to come, come to our church. But that's backwards. Jesus said, go into the highways and hedges and compel men to come. That word compel means to earnestly, passionately beg people to come. Highways and hedges, you, this, these are the places that, that normal people wouldn't hang out. Yeah, normal people hang out on the highways, the clean spots, the nice places, the good neighborhoods. But God said, I want you to go into the highways, into the hedges, into the thicket into the dark places. Go in there and compel men to come. Snatch them up in here. Pull them out of it. Listen, let me put it like this. When, for example, when people come into our midst, if people give their life to Jesus, or people visit our church, we should have a fit. We should go bananas. We should just go in. I mean, last week we had a young lady, a 12 year old, came and gave her life to Jesus. And we started rejoicing. Had a couple people join last week, and we started rejoicing. But anytime we see somebody new, or see somebody visiting, or see somebody get their life right, we should go into a fit, into a spanktoranium. You know why? Because that's what we were sent here to do. <laughs> I don't want musicians who don't get excited when people get saved. I don't want worship leaders who don't get excited when people get saved. I don't want deacons. I don't want ministers who don't get excited when people get saved because this is what we've been called to do. If we're not doing anything else and nobody gets saved, then we have failed at our job. Oh, didn't they sing today? So what? Oh, didn't they play that song good? So what? The question was, did anybody get saved? Did anybody get delivered? Did anybody join? Did anybody come out of a situation? That's when we should get saved. So look, this is going to be a practice test. Michael, come on with me. This is going to be a practice test for everybody. I want you to imagine the many souls that are going to come in this door. I want you to imagine this altar being filled with broken people who are crying out to Jesus. I want you to imagine they're coming from every open door and they're all the way down the aisles. And I want you to practice what we're going to do when we see that.
you got to come on with me. I said, I want you to rejoice. Okay, okay. That was pretty good. That was pretty good. Hold on. Let me give you some more practice because some of y'all ain't got it yet. Some of y'all think we came to church to be dressed up. Some of y'all just came to church because it's Sunday and you used to come to church. Some of y'all came because your mama brought you. Some of y'all came because your husband said, if we don't go to church, I'm not going to stay with you. But, 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 but I want you to imagine somebody, your child getting saved. I want you to imagine your child coming down this aisle and pulling the needle out of their arm. I want you to imagine your child coming down here and saying, I'm going to serve God for real. I want you to imagine your spouse, your husband, your wife coming up here and giving their life to Jesus. Now, you got one more time to practice this. Imagine your neighbor coming out of it. Imagine your coworker coming out of it. Imagine your friends coming out of it. Imagine your daughters coming out of it. Now rejoice. Now rejoice. Now rejoice. Now rejoice. Now rejoice. Yeah, you almost there. It's almost celebration. I got a few folk that's still looking around like they're a wallflower, but I want somebody that rejoices in the Lord. Okay. That's good. And I'm going to give you one more chance to practice this. I want you to imagine yourself coming out of a situation. I want you to imagine yourself coming out of poverty. I want you to imagine yourself coming out of drug addiction. I want you to imagine yourself coming out of loneliness and self-esteem. And I'm going to give you one more chance to rejoice. If God's pulled you out of anything, I die you to rejoice. That addiction can't hold you, that habit can't hold you, that sin can't hold you, that relationship can't hold you. Rejoice! Celebrate! Celebrate! So why you got us doing all this dress rehearsal, doing all this practicing? Because for some of you, you've forsaken your first ministry. You forgot that God saved you to save somebody else. That God delivered you to deliver somebody else. That God helped you so you can help somebody else. So, so I'm going to introduce you back to your ministry. <laughs> How many people ready to go back to your ministry? I'm, I'm going back to my ministry. Connie, I'm going back to my ministry. I know what it's like to get sidetracked and get distracted and start thinking it's about this and that and the other. But God is calling us back to our ministry. Lift your hands and say, God, I'm, I'm surrendering. I'm surrendering. I'm surrendering. I'm surrendering. I'm surrendering. I'm answering the call of God on my life. I'm answering the call of God on my life. I feel you calling me. Calling me to make a difference. Calling me to change somebody's life. Throw your hands up and say yes to the Lord. I'm a bridge builder. I'm a connector. That's what I do. That's what I do. You almost there. You almost there. You almost there. Where are my connectors at in the room? Where are my connectors at in the room? Here, my Lord. I'll go. Here, my Lord. I'm, I'm not too cute. I'm not too pretty. I'm not too fancy. I'm not too smart. I'm not too rich. 
I surrender. Oh, yeah. Be reconciled to God. Come back to God. Get back in place. I implore you on behalf of God to come back to God. I implore you, I beg you, as if God was standing, as if I was in Christ's stead, I'm begging you to come back to God. You know what tickles me about saints? We talk about, Lord, send me to Africa. Send me to Australia. Send me around the world and preach for you. And you won't even reach across the fence and talk to your neighbor. How do I believe that God has called you to the nations when you won't even talk to people in your own house? But today God said, you know how we're going to fill this church up? When every one of you start operating in your real ministry. You think it's magic. It's you. It's you. It's us. They're not just going to come because the building is sitting here. They're going to come because you're operating in your ministry. I don't know who I'm talking to in here, but God sent me on his behalf to beg you. Come back to God. Come back. Not just to the church. Not just to the building. But back to your relationship with God. You ain't got to leave the church to backslide. You ain't got to leave the church to back. You can be backslidden right in the church. I know I got to get back because I don't, I don't pray like I used to. I don't seek his face like I used to. I don't get in the word like I used to. Everybody talking about shaking off this corona weight. We done picked up 10 pounds here and there from sitting at home. Some of y'all need to sh throw off some spiritual corona weight you done got stuff attached to you that's not even like you you know better than that God is calling you back to ministry back to building bridges back to connecting people lift your hands over this building begin to worship I surrender Lord if you're watching me online I assure you in Christ's stead. Your ministry is not to tear people down, it's to build people up. It's what he called you for. It's what he called you for. Yeah. Listen, I want to talk to somebody. You may be watching me online and maybe, maybe you're in this room. Stand to your feet. We're going to go home. Maybe you're in this room and maybe you're watching me online. But my suspicion is that you have given up your real ministry. And you've taken on this judgmental spirit. This judgmental attitude. How do I know? Because everything that comes out of your mouth is always critical. You notice that? You never have anything encouraging to say to anybody. Everything's always negative, critical, putting people down, pushing people away, kicking people out. When was the last time that you just called somebody and said, good job, good job? I don't mean you have to go overboard and try to build up their ego, I mean, of course nobody's perfect. Of course nobody's got it all together. But when was the last time you just walked up to somebody and said, I like your outfit. I like your smile. Good to see you. Not where you been. I know you've been in something. No, just good to see you. Glad you made it. So look, in the 30 seconds I have right here, I, I'm, I'm going to call somebody. 
I don't know who I'm even talking to. But somebody that God is calling back into your ministry. You didn't used to be like that. I remember you. You didn't used to always be like that. You used to be very encouraging and very inspiring and uplifting. But life has beat you up. Things have gone wrong. Your self-esteem has gone to pot. And God said, I want you to answer your call today. Lift your hands right here. 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 We're going back into ministry. I'm deputizing everybody in this room to go back into ministry. This is God calling you back into your place. This is God speaking to you to say it's time for you to get in position. Oh my God. Get in position. They need you on that job. They need you in that community. You're the light of your family. You're the Joseph of your family. You ain't got time to get into arguments. You ain't got time to get in petty disputes. God wants to use you. Throw your hands up and say, Lord, I surrender. I surrender. I surrender. If that's you, lift your hands and just talk to the master right here. I surrender everything. Everything, everything in me, I'm going to give it to you, Lord. Listen, if you're in here and you don't know Jesus Christ and you've been feeling out of sorts and wondering if there's a place for you, listen, don't let these people in this room intimidate you. Everybody in here, everybody in here done been through something. Is an X something. Don't think that what you have is so bad or so wretched that God can't deliver you. Standing all around you are a great cloud of witnesses who can testify. If it had not been for Jesus, I wouldn't be here. So if you're wondering if you're in the right place, you are. You're in the right place. You're among the right people. We ain't fancy. We ain't fancy. We ain't highfalutin. We got expensive shoes and, sh and shirts and dresses and all that, but underneath all that stuff, we just folks. We just spoke that God done pulled out of something. So if you're in here and you want to give your life to Jesus, I want to give you the opportunity to come and give your life to God. If there's one in here today, I need to give my life to Jesus. I need to do it today. This is my day. I need to hear this. If you're a backslider, you're a backslider. You know who you are. You know where you're supposed to be. Let me see your hand. I, I need you to do something in my life, Lord, right here. Right here. If you're somebody who needs church membership, I see your hand in the back. I see your hand in the back. If you're somebody who desires church membership, I just need to be connected with some people who understand where I am. I can't be around people that got their nose up, act like they don't understand what I'm talking about. I, I need to be with some raw, real people. And you sense that this church and this preacher and this pastor is raw. <laughs> He's real. I'm going to shoot you straight. I'm going to tell you what it is. And I just want to connect with this church. I want to open the doors to the church. If you're online and you want to join our church, become an e-member. This is your church. Just go to our website and put in that field right there where it says e-membership. And somebody from our team will contact you to let you know what your next steps are. You can do that right now. Amen. You can do that right now. But if you're in this room and you need church membership, I want to invite you right now to come to this altar. I want to give you the right hand of fellowship. I want to join the Impact Church. I want to, I want to have an impact on my life. Where's that hand that was backslidden? Somebody go minister to her right there. Right there. Right there. If you didn't notice, I want you to notice it. Keep your head on a swivel in this church because there's going to be people all around you. All around you that need ministry. That need ministry. Yeah. She was back there in the back. Amen. Now, I done gave y'all the practice. What y'all supposed to do? What y'all supposed to do, Michael, when people get ready? When people... Oh, 
Oh, she ain't feeling you yet. I said, make some noise and celebrate her. I said, come on, y'all. Y'all don't have to practice. Y'all know what y'all supposed to do. Come on. Somebody give God praise. Yes! Hallelujah! 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 The devil's mad, but I'm so glad because he missed the soul that he thought he had. Somebody need to rejoice. Somebody need to rejoice. Somebody need to rejoice. Rejoice! <laughs> oh, the devil's mad now. The devil's mad now. Listen, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Listen, if you're watching me online, I'm so glad that you're watching me. Pray for us. Listen, saints, I want y'all to be praying for me. I'm going to be traveling to uh, San Bernardino, California this week. I'm going to be ministering the word of God at the Way World Outreach Church. And I want you to be praying for me that God would give me a word to impact that church and that city and that congregation. So just be, as you think about me, lift me up in prayer. But I'll be back, Lord willing, to speak the word of God to you on next Sunday. Also, I want you to be looking for an email from me. I, I mentioned on last week that we're going to be putting together a soul winners class. And so in a few, I'm just about ready for that. We're going to put together a Saturday morning. We're going to send out information for you. And we're going to help you overcome your intimidation, your fear, and show you how to simply and effectively win people for Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. You need to know something about your pastor. Your pastor's radical. He's radical. And uh, <laughs> I know she's laughing. He's radical. And Mark is a witness. I mean, it, it, it might just fall on me any time to start witnessing to somebody. We, me and some of the diggers were sitting around one day getting ready to uh, have a meal and they brought the meal out the waitress did and we was getting ready to pray over the meal and I looked up and said to the waitress do you have something that I need to pray about and she was so stuck I did yeah yeah we get ready to pray over our food and before we do I just want to include you in that prayer and tears leaped up in her eyes as she started sharing about her father and how sick he was and some other things that were happening in her life and she stood there and started praying with us and tears, tears started coming down her face. And before we knew it, somebody else who was working there came alongside her asking, can you pray for me too? Yeah, yeah. And before we knew it, people were sitting, I'm, I'm am I telling the truth, Mark? And before we knew it, there were other people sitting around in the restaurant who had their tears, their faces wet with tears and saying how much they were, you know what I'm saying? You gotta understand, you ain't gotta be up here to do this. There's opportunities around you everywhere for God to use you. And so I want you as radical as I am. Bold, radical, unintimidated. How are you going to be a soul winner and you scared to talk to people? The funny thing about people is you bold about everything else. <laughs> yeah, you bold when it comes to something else. Let somebody scratch your car. You get bold then. <laughs> Take your seat at a concert. <laughs> Do something with them kids. You get bold. It's only when we come to Jesus that we get intimidated. I don't want to say nothing. I, 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 I. Some of you people got all that mouth. You ought to be winning folks like crazy. Amen. I, I think you should. I don't think that when God, see, some of y'all got the gift of gab. You run your mouth about stuff you know, stuff you don't know. You just don't shut up. And when God saved you, he didn't take that away from you. He just wants to use it for his glory. So just like you was out in the world running the street, Getting wild, getting crazy. Some of y'all, the party didn't start till you showed up. <laughs> See, I know. Okay, sit down, basic. You walk in the party. Hey, the party started. I'm here. Hey, everybody knew you was there. Now you're in church. You want to sit in the corner and be quiet. The devil's a lie. Look at somebody and say, God, use me. God's going to use me. All right, I'm done for real. I ain't telling no more jokes. <laughs> Lift your hands to the God, to the Lord, to the Lord. Father, I thank you for every person in the sound of my voice. Lord, we ministered, we preached, we jested, 
we spoke, we implored. But I pray that somebody would leave this place on fire for you and be convinced that they have been called to be bridge builders in your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody clap your hands and give God praise. Why don't you?